Thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, it's good to see a fairly decent turnout. Closer, not louder, closer. There we go. Alrighty, thanks again for everyone showing up. Uh, we just wanted to get some people together, express or talk about some awesome things that we are building here at Box, as well as some awesome things that are happening around the MySQL community. Uh, we have three talks today. Uh, the first one will be about the spatula tool that we have built here at Box to handle uh, basically master failover in the event that a server dies. Uh, the second talk will be uh, based around the shift tool, uh, which is a GUI tool built on top of PT Online Schema Change, uh, which everyone knows is a pain in the tail to do in MySQL. So that tool is also awesome. And finally, we have Matt from Yelp giving us a talk about this query plan drift, correct? All right. So let's go ahead and kick it off with uh, Zihan and Richard and uh, have the floor. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Richard. This is Zihan. Oh, sorry. So today, we're going to talk about spatula. Can everyone hear in the back? All right. So first, a quick introduction. I'm Richard Pawn. This is Zihan Lee. And both of us are part of the tools and automation team here at Box. So we're both engineers, and we build tools. We automate things for our DBAs. The DBA is sitting amongst you, a part of Box, our customers. We want to make sure that they don't have to do repetitive tests or tasks, and they can sleep better at night. So I have two slides about Box, just to give a little bit of context. I'm going to read the slide. Box is a modern content management platform that transforms how organizations work and collaborate to achieve results faster. And to give you an idea of our scale, there's a couple stats. We have 57,000 customers, 49, sorry, 59% of the Fortune 500 use Box, and we have 45 million users. And so because so many customers rely on Box, we have some goals about our availability. Box.com and our Box clients, we have a goal of three nines which means 99.9% .9 uptime. However, as you can imagine, everything in Box relies on our database, so our uptime goals are a little bit higher at four nines, 99.99%. To give you an idea of what this means, to give you a little perspective, I broke it down into the inverse, downtime. So we're allowed our goal of less than five minutes of downtime per month. And if we think about that on a daily basis, it's about nine seconds of downtime. And so is this hard or is this easy? Well, we have lots of data. So this slide's a little bit old. I actually am not allowed to share any new information, but you can just imagine that the numbers here are a little bit higher today than they were here last year. And so it's a lot of data. It'd be a lot easier if we could store it in one place. It'd be very easy to manage. But as you can imagine, we can't put it in one place. So we split it up and distribute it among pods. So a pod is our name of just a piece of our data. So let's go inside. And what's inside a database pod? So this is a high-level view of what a database pod. A database pod consists of a group of MySQL instances distributed over multiple physical hosts, distributed over multiple data centers. So in this case, we have DC1, DC2. Both of those are our primary data centers. And we also have DR, which is our disaster recovery. We use master-master replication, which means at any given time for any pod, we can say, this pod, you're going to use DC1. Or we can say, this pod, you're DC2. And we can flip back and forth, and it's fine. So what happens if we have an outage? Maybe we have a hardware failure. So how do we remediate that? So the process is pretty simple. Suppose DC2 is our active data center. We have an outage. Something stops working. 
We'll detect that. We just flip over to the other side. So we're flipping our pod. We page a DBA. The DBAs perform their magic. They fix whatever is wrong with the database pod. And voila, we're back to a good state. So before Spatula, what really happened? It looks something like this. But to make things a little bit simpler, there's like some high level parts. We have this thing called the health checker, which checks to see if our database instances are healthy or not. We have dependencies on our web app. We have some PHP scripts. We have email, actually. We wake up a DBA in the middle of the night, and they go and fix our problems. So a lot of human intervention. So as you can imagine, well, how long did it used to take to me remediate an outage? Well, the answer is we didn't know. Does it happen during the middle of the day, middle of the night? Does our DBA get paged and they get locked out of their computer? Do they spill coffee on the computer? A lot of things can happen. So maybe there's a better way to do it. And we, we thought is well, let's throw some automation around the problem. So now let's compare our legacy remediation process to Spatula. So what does Spatula give us? The process looks something like this. We still have this service called Health Checker to tell us is our database instance up or down, and then we have Spatula, and that's it. Spatula will automatically flip our database pods for us if we detect that there's a failure. Now I'll talk about the high level. So how does Spatula fit into our multi data center architecture. We'll let's start with a very simple diagram. We have database instances in each of our three data centers. We have this health checker service in each of our data centers. Each health checker service is checking all of our MySQL instances. If there's a problem, we'll just fire off an alert and we use PagerDuty for that. We'll wake up a DBA so they can do some investigation. We'll also take that information and put that into Zookeeper. So Zookeeper is our source of truth to know if a database instance is up or down. We have spatula instances in each of our data centers. Actually, only one of these is active at any given time. Just watching Zookeeper. And if we see that one of our MySQL instances goes down, then we change our database configuration, and we do some additional alerting so our DBAs can know what's going on, and they can fix something if they need to. So I'm, now I'm going to pass this off to Zihan, and he can start off with remediation performance. Hello, everyone. So now uh, let's take a look at how Spatula improves the database failover performance. Before Spatula comes into being, many remediation is performed by the DBAs. Uh, and uh, in this live example, at 1.35 PM, the DB server one went down, and a notification is sent to DBA right away. After another one minute, the DBA sits in front of his computer, logged in, and then SSH to the production machine. And it takes the DBA five minutes to investigate and also finish the manual remediation. So altogether, it takes the DBA eight minutes to wrap up the whole manual remediation process. By contrast, by using spatula, after the DB server two went down, spatula is notified of this issue and doing the auto remediation right away. So the whole process takes only 46 seconds, which is 10 times faster than what is before. After we put a spatula online uh, in April, it did three successful auto failover. And on average, each remediation takes less than 50 seconds. So now let's take a look at the internal architecture of spatula itself. Spatula service consists of two major components. The first is called the ZK detector actor. It is a component which is listening at some of the zookeeper nodes, which stores the health status for all the DB instances on the active side. 
once a uh, monitored active DB instance goes down, this guy will be notified and send the all the current bad DB instance information to the root engine actor. And on the root engine actor side, it will go through a set of rules to pick a DB instance candidate and then find its containing pod uh, host and flip all the pods located on this DB server host. Here are some of the outstanding rules. The first is called DB instance filter rule. The reason of having this rule is uh, the reason of having this rule is uh, for some of the DB instances, uh, they are not replicating between uh, DC1 and DC2, but they are replicating between, let's say, DC1 and the disaster recovery. Because the spatula is designed to flip the database pods between DC1 and DC2, but not DC1 and the disaster re recovery. So we need to filter out those database pods. And the, the other benefits of having this rule is it makes us easier to roll out the spatula service. And the second outstanding rule is called flip-flop protection rule. This rule is used to prevent the flip-flop for a particular database pod. So once spatula flipped a pod, the spatula uh, will not be allowed to uh, to fail back for, the, for that particular part. The next rule is called throttling rule. So this rule is used to put restriction on how many database paths we can flip within a predefined period of time. And the last rule is used to uh, prevent spatula from flipping the database paths when the pipeline, the push pipeline is occupied by someone else. So as you can see, uh, spatula is able to reject the auto failover if any of this rule is violated. In, in these exceptional cases, manual remediation is needed, which means we need the DBA and the spatula to work seamlessly to perform either the manual remediation or the auto remediation in a timely manner. This is why we designed and implemented this DBA spatula workflow. In this workflow, let's assume on the DB server host one, 3306, there are two database pods called X and Y. When this DB server goes down, the first pager duty alert will be sent from health checker. Right away, Spatula will, will be aware of the issue and send the second pager duty alert saying, I'm aware of the issue and I'm working on it. Okay. After sending the, the second pager duty alert, Spatula will try to make decision on whether to flip or not after going through some, some rules in the rule engine. So, after making the, the decision, it will send the third pager duty alert saying whether I abandon remediation or I continue to remediate the issue. Let's assume Spatula decides to flip the database pods. After flip is done, it will send the last pager duty alert notifying DBA whether remediation succeeded or failed. If it failed, DBA needs to do the manual re remediation. And all these pager duty alert will arrive on the DBA side within one minute. And all the pager duty alerts sent from the spatula are used to help DBA to decide whether human intervention is needed in a timely manner. And that's all. Any questions? Uh, let's see, we're actually gonna put off questions until the end. Mm -hmm. uh, that way we don't have to time box anybody. Uh, so, you guys are free to go ahead and take a seat and we'll call you back up at the end. Okay. And we will move on to discussing schema migrations with a fancy tool.
So every. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'll hand you this one. I'll let you introduce yourself. You seem capable. So yes, uh, while we are waiting to get his stuff set up, we should probably uh, show some appreciation for the talk that we just got from uh, Zihan and Richard. So everybody. Does anyone know the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> and uh, yeah, if Tiffany, if you want to, yeah. Tiffany's on her way. So while we're waiting to get Michael set up, if everybody wants to just chat amongst yourself, I will come back on and let you know. Hello. Cool. All right, Michael Finch from Square, everyone. Okay. Nice to meet all of you guys. Um, so I'm going to be talking about shift, uh, alter your database schema with the click of a button. My name is Michael Finch. I'm a platform engineer. I work at Square. I'm currently on the database team, helping them with uh, tooling and automation. OK, so what is Shift? Um, Shift is a service that we wrote that helps you alter your database schema. Um, I put my SQL in parentheses because in its current implementation, it only works for altering my SQL databases. But with a little bit of work, there's no reason it couldn't work for any other relational data source. Um, and basically, it's uh, essentially a UI that sits on top of PT Online Schema Change. And uh, for any of you that might not know what PT Online Schema Change is, it's a tool written by Percona, um, and it, assen it essentially helps you do online alters. So it'll create a new table with the new schema that you want, um, slowly copy the data from your existing table to the new table, and then do an atomic rename at the end. Um, so it's uh, a great tool. You should check it out if you haven't already. Um, if you have a really small app, you know, with uh, few thousand rows in your database, you're probably never going to need it. You can run alters directly. But if you have services with millions of rows, um, running alters directly on your, on your database are going to, are going to cause it to lock up. And so you're going to need to use an online altering tool like PT Online Schema. Um, and so Shift is, yeah, as I said, a UI that we built on top of that. Um, and we use it at Square to run thousands of migrations a month. Uh, so just to give you some history and like uh, a look into what our infrastructure looks like. So two years ago, we didn't have a database uh, team at all. And we had a few like really beefy database servers that were just running one instance of MySQL. And they had you know, 60 databases on them, one for each app. And um, there's just really poor isolation because they're all running on the same server, um, sharing the same memory. And it was really easy for one database to negatively affect, like one service to negatively, negatively affect uh, other services that were on that same uh, piece of hardware. And at that time, mainly because we didn't have a DBA team, uh, developers generally avoided uh, altering their schema if they could because the process was very manual. They had to file a ticket. Someone had had to go in and you know, get it approved, run it, manually run PT Online schema change. It just wasn't a great process. Um, and occasionally, uh, developers would accidentally run migrations directly against their database when they deployed, which I'm not sure. I'm sure it's happened to some people here. It like, will lock up the table and will take down the service. 
Um, so we just didn't have a great solution uh, back then uh, for doing schema changes. Um, and in the past two years, we've worked to um, essentially break down these shared databases into a lot of micro ones. Um, and so every app gets its own private container um, with its own IP space and its own memory allocated to it. Um, and a lot of containers still sit on a physical host, but we have like a good amount of isolation. Um, and in a, like a big goal of this process was to also give uh, applications the tools they need to manage their own database. Because now when they connect to their database, it's just uh, one MySQL instance running their database. Um, and we want them to be able to, to do things to it that they need to. Uh, versus in the past, uh, they would connect to the database. There's just a lot of other stuff there. And you wouldn't want them to accidentally break uh, someone else's service. For example, if they wanted to upgrade to a new version of MySQL, um, back then that wasn't something that they could do, and now they can. Um, and so Shift is a tool that kind of evolved out of this goal of, like, let's give developers tools to do the things uh, that they need to do on their own. Um, so yeah, the problem statement that we, appro that we had in mind when we approached uh, building Shift is uh, running schema migrations manually either takes too much time um, and it's uh, prone to human error. So if you're running a lot of PTOSC processes, uh, you can easily like put in a typo and it causes a problem. Um, and also just the, the full manual process like could definitely be improved. Uh, so what we set out to build. So phase one of the project was to, the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to add some functionality to PT Online Schema Change. Um, to allow us to do some things that it doesn't currently let you do, and I'll discuss those in a minute. Um, and we also wanted to build this web UI, uh, web UI where people could go in, file migrations, they could see the status of them, um, and see like the full cycle of their migrations in like this one place um, that looks good. Um, but at that point, migrations would still be run manually. So developers would go file them there, um, the DBA team would then go run it manually. We would update the UI so the developers could see the status. Um, but the end experience for the developer was the same at that time. It was just the, the DBA were, well, DBAs were like the back end service doing the actual work. Um, and so phase two was to write a service that will automatically do the back end work. Um, so automatically run the migrations um, for us. OK, so first, uh, for the PTOSC patch, uh, we basically added three new flags, um, the first one being save state. And so if you pass this flag while you're running PTOSC, it'll constantly save the state of where uh, the process is in a migration. Um, so PTOSC copies chunks of rows at a time from your existing table into the new table. Um, and so when you pass this flag, it'll essentially just record what the last um, row that it copied from the old table to the new table is, uh, which leads us to the second flag that we added, load state. Um, so if you pass that um, pointing at a, a save state file that you had previously created, you can just pick up the migration from where it had last left, last left off. Uh, and this other flag we added, exit it, and basically if you define exit it, you can quit a migration at different stages. Um, so either after you create the new table or after you create the triggers, or after you're done copying all of the rows, um, et cetera. And we'll get into some examples. Uh, yeah, so an example of how uh, these flags could be useful. Um, so if you run with save state, and let's say uh, you, you lose connection to the database. Traditionally, with PTOSC, lose connection to the database, it fails. Um, you kind of have to clean up, start over. But if you had been running with save state, then you could rerun the exact same command, but with the load state flag. Um, and we, it would just resume where you had previously left off. Um, so potentially saving you a lot of time if you're running a migration that takes three days, for example. Um, and then you can also combine these flags, um, like the exit at, save state, load state, to do a lot of um, cool things, um, which we do in shift and will make a little bit more sense later. OK, so the second part of phase one was the web UI. Um, and this is just a Rails app. Uh, and yeah, like I said, it's a place where you can just go in, you file migrations, you can see the status of them. 
um, and developers can just see the full life cycle of a migration there. Uh, it's really easy for them to understand like what's going on. Um, and at Square, every developer has access to it, so they can go file a migration, they can run them there. Um, and the front end also exposes all these migrations uh, via an API to the back end runner, which we'll see in a second. Uh, yeah, just taking a step back, so I said the, the UI is a place where you can manage the life cycle of migration. Uh, this is just uh, a, dis like a description of the migration flow, which you can see basically on any page in the UI. Um, and so uh, at any point in time, your migration is going to be in one of these states. And uh, so if you're ever curious as to where it is and what comes next, like this is what you can look at. So the first step is preparing migration, um, and then this awaiting approval, awaiting start, running, um, all, and all the way down to completed. Um, and there's some error states down here. And we'll get into these in more detail. OK, and then phase two was the back end runner, which uh, actually runs the migrations for us. And we'll call it shift runner. Uh, so we wrote it in Go. Um, and basically, it's just running in an infinite loop, pulling the front end, looking for new migrations. Um, and depending on the state that the migration is in, the, uh, the shift runner will do different things. Um, and the runner logs everything it does, and that log file is exposed in the UI. So it makes it really, easier for, really easy for developers to see like, if there's errors, like what went wrong. Um, yeah. OK, so these are the different states that the uh, shift runner can handle. So it's pulling the, a pulling the API from the front end. It gets, a, it gets a migration. It's in the preparing step. When that happens, it um, will, collect, or will connect to the database that's being migrated and collect some stats about the table, uh, send them back to the UI so that they can be viewed, uh, and it'll also do a dry run of the, uh, the schema change to make sure like, the DDL is valid and everything's going to work. Uh, and the next state is running the migration. Um, and so this is where the runner will actually shell out to PTOSC. Um, and while PTOSC is running, uh, we're, we're constantly just monitoring the standard out and standard error and, set, and parsing that to get the status of the migration and sending that back to the UI. Um, another state is renaming tables. And so. What we do is we finish the copy of all the records from the existing table and the new table, and then we essentially exit there. Um, and then in another step, we explicitly rename the tables. Um, the runner can also ha handle canceling a migration. And if you cancel it, it will kill the PTOC process and drop triggers. So it'll completely just get rid of it. Um, and it can also pause the migration, which will kill the PTOC process, but keep the triggers around. Uh, the reason for that being that if the triggers are still there, you could then later go ahead and resume the, the migration. OK, now quick demo and screenshots of just like the standard flow of like how you file a migration, how you run one. Um, so if you start up the Rails app, this is the home page. Uh, you got different groupings of migrations. So you have migrations that are, uh, that are running, uh, migrations that are pending, uh, completed, failed, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just going to go in the top corner and click on Create a Request, um, so which takes you to this, this, this field, or this form. And uh, the first thing you select is a cluster. Uh, you select a database. You put in the DDL statement. Um, and there's some other fields that we'll get into later. Uh, and then you click Submit. And this is a little bit small, but I'll just kind of explain what's going on. So after you click Submit, it takes you to this page, and it's in the preparing step. Um, and so right now, the runner is picking up this job, and it's uh, doing the things it knows to do uh, to prepare a migration. Uh, and then when it's done, it moves it into this awaiting approval step. And you probably can't see, but there's these uh, table stats, like table row start. Uh, table size start, index size start that got sent back um, during the prepare step. And so now it's awaiting approval. Whoever goes to approve this like looks at that information, they decide, OK, uh, this is safe to approve. 
Uh, maybe if it's like a really huge table, they want to add a comment saying like, oh, don't start this until you know, after peak hours, whatever. Um, and then you can see the actions at the bottom. Uh, you can click approve. Uh, and now it's awaiting start. And so you could start or unapprove it. So if we click start, it will go into the running migration step. And this is where the runner picks it up. And it uh, shells out to PTOSC and starts running. And as PTOSC prints out uh, like how far along in the migra migration it is, like 20%, 30%, every time it prints that out, uh, this gets sent back to the UI. And so this uh, copy percent bar just gets updated in real time. Uh, so that's really useful for developers if they have a migration that takes like three or four days. Um, they can always just check this copy percentage to see how far along their migration is. Um, and actions that you could do right now are pause or cancel. So pause will, um, again, it'll just kill the process, but leave the triggers around, and cancel will just completely wipe everything out. Uh, so let's say that the, copy, that the PTOC process finishes. Uh, it'll take us to this next stage, awaiting renames. So uh, all the rows have been copied, but uh, the tables have yet to be renamed. Um, and so you just click the button at the bottom to rename. The rename is in progress. And then it sends back to the UI saying it's completed. And it also has sent back some, the same stats about the table, but uh, as they are at the end of the migration. So you can compare uh, what the table looked like before and what it looked like after. after. OK, so that was a high level overview. Um, so now we'll get into some specific features. Uh, so the types of DDL we support support our drop table, create table, alter table. Um, so all alter tables go through PTOSC. Drops and creates, we just run directly on the database. Um, uh, another, another cool thing is we wrote our own parser. Um, we looked around for a DDL parser uh, and couldn't find one. There's like DML parsers, but there, there was no good DDL parser, so we actually wrote our own which actually allows us to do a lot of really cool things. Uh, number one being, so when you go, when a user is submitting a migration and they put in their DDL statement, uh, we can just validate on the fly whether or not it's valid syntax. Um, so that's pretty useful. Um, it also gives us the pet potential to do fast alters. So if we see that they are dropping an index and that's all they're doing in their alter, um, you can actually just run that alter statement directly against MySQL and it'll be instant. So there's no reason to even go through using PTOSC in that situation. Um, and it allows us to add things to DDL statements as well. So for example, um, we, like, if, if, if the DDL were to say um, row format equals compressed, we also verify that if they haven't set a key block size, we'll set, we'll set one for them, one of the key block sizes that we support. Uh, pausing and resuming, which I mentioned before, it's uh, really useful when database comes under load. Um, so if their, app, if their uh, latency of an app goes up and they're running an OSC and they don't want to lose all progress, they can just click pause. And that will leave the triggers around. So it'll alleviate some load, uh, the load of like the PTOC actually copying. But there's still uh, the extra lo some extra load of having the triggers around. Uh, but it's at least worth a shot of seeing if it um, you know, eases that, that latency enough so that you can keep it around. Um, and also errors can be resumed. So if your migration is running and in the middle it exceeds the number of threads running that PTOC will allow you to do, whatever you set it to be, um, PTOC will fail. But uh, with the resume button, you can just pick up from where it left off. Um, Access controls. So there's very granular access controls around who can run and approve what. Um, on, so you can set on a cluster basis, like these users can approve and run migrations on these clusters, but not on these, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, it's really easy to delegate all of this out to um, developers. So the DBA team actually has to do basically nothing. Um, and we also have notifications. For us, we have email and Slack. Uh, but it's very easy to, easy to integrate your own um, notification system. And this is just like a sample of an email like our DBA team gets when someone files a new migration. Uh, native comments. So 
this was built, uh, I guess, out of a need because people were filing migrations and then any discussion that needed to happen around them, uh, someone would start like an email thread. So we're like, okay, we should just build a commenting system into Shift so that all of that could happen within the app. Um, so that's that. Uh, we also have this thing called a final insert, which is uh, basically at the end of a successful, mi successful migration will allow you to do a single insert, insert statement into a table. Uh, and that's useful for like ORMs that keep track of uh, the schema version you're on. So you can, in, in, for Rails, for example, there's uh, a table called schema version. And uh, at the end of, when you alter a table, you insert into the schema version saying, uh, now we're on version 10, so that next time you deploy, the app sees, okay, this change is already out there, this, the deploy is safe to go forward. Um, and we have some filtering by uh, the person who filed migrations. Uh, you can search by DDL, uh, filter by cluster. So it's just really easy to search uh, and see the history of uh, stuff that's happened. Um, so dealing with shards. So when we first built it, we didn't have a good solution for this. And when we tried to move a service that had a lot of shards onto Shift, we realized that uh, we needed to offer them something to help with that. Um, for example, one of the apps has 120 shards. And uh, basically, before we built support for this, uh, it would have involved someone going in and manually filing 120 different requests and running them one by one. And that obviously isn't sustainable. So we created this concept of meta requests. And a meta request is just a collection of uh, just migration requests that all share a single DDL. Um, and so basically, in the creation process, you put in a DDL statement, and then we, we allow you to multi-select clusters and databases. Um, and then we also allow you, once they're submitted, to run them in bulk. Um, and so that really alleviates um, the problem of uh, sharding. So I'll show some screenshots of that. Um, so basically here, this is filing a new meta request. You put in your D DDL statement. Uh, and then down here for your clusters, you can select multiple different clusters. And then for each cluster that gets selected, it shows you all its databases. And you can multi-select databases. Um, and then when you click Submit, you get taken to a page like this. Uh, where it just has the DDL statement at the top and just a list of all of the indiv individual migrations that apply to that. Um, these ones are already all completed, but basically you can um, select like all of these or you can select certain ones and then you can apply actions to them in bulk. So uh, if you could approve all of them at once, you can start them all at once, et cetera. It just makes it really easy to deal with shards. Uh, so constraints and limitations. Uh, number one, the parser that we wrote is pretty strict, and it's also only for 5.5 uh, five grammar. Um, so there's some frictions with developers when uh, they have a DDL statement that they can run on their laptop, but it doesn't strictly follow the published MySQL grammar. Um, and so uh, we deny them from submitting it. This could be improved. Um, Another thing is we won't allow you to alter tables with foreign keys unless you're dropping all of the foreign keys. Um, this is by design. We don't want foreign keys in our environment. Uh, it also just makes it more difficult to uh, work with P PTOC when you have foreign keys. Um, and along those lines, we also don't have any triggers in our environment. And that's a limitation of PTOC because it has to create its own triggers. Um, integration with developer workflows is limited. so. Uh, generally now, developers will write some code in, say, Rails, and Rails will print out some SQL that they need to run. They have to copy, paste it into the UI, click Submit. Uh, this could be improved, I think. We would like to work on improving that. Um, yeah, the PTOC threshold arguments are the same for all clusters. so. Um, threads running, um, slave lag, these different uh, things that you can set on a migration that will uh, set limits for it. Anyway, they're set globally. They could, uh, for improvement, be set at a per cluster basis. Um, we could make our error reporting better to the UI, which would make uh, it easier for developers to debug things on their own. 
And we don't really have a good story around submitting a lot of migrations that aren't for a single sharded app. So where to go from here? So uh, definitely want to fo focus on addressing the limitations. Um, and first up is going to be making uh, integration with developer workflows uh, better so it's easier for them to file migrations um, from their normal workflows. Uh, we're going to consider a rewrite of PTOSC, uh, probably in Go, better hooks. So you could say, like, oh, after each, you, know, you could have hooks after each like, significant step in the process. Um, and maybe support things like where clauses so you could prune data while you're running a PTOSC. Um, and try to get other companies to use Shift and provide feedback. So summary, um, basically it works great for us. We can run migrations that take seven plus days, run thousands a month, um, and they take up very little of our DBA team's time. Uh, so it works great for us, you guys should try it too. Uh, and you can find this, so we open sourced this about a month ago, you can find it at github.com slash square slash shift. Uh, and any questions, uh, that's my email. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So like Michael said, that is open source. So if anybody sees it and they want to uh, make it better, obviously he's accepting pull requests and would love for you to jump on and uh, obviously make it better. Next up we have Matt. He's from Yelp. He's going to be talking about uh, tuning some knobs and some levers to make uh, query plan drift not happen once he's logged in. Once I'm logged in, yeah. And we're once good. I have my speaker notes. Not for you, though. Apparently, I need to turn off mirroring. Okay, cool. So uh, my name is Matt Ulmer. I'm a DBA with Yelp. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, errant cattle and query plan drift. So uh, first, though, we have to. Is it not full screen? Sorry about that. Um, so first I have to give you some PR slides, kind of like Box did. Uh, if you don't know about us, uh, Yelp's mission is connecting people with great local businesses. Um, and here's some stats as of the end of Q1, which just closed. Uh, we have 90 million unique mobile visitors, 102 million uh, reviews have been contributed at this point in time, and 70% of our searches are done on mobile. We are presently live in 32 countries. Um, so I'm gonna start off and, and tell you, you can't hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I'll, I'll try and talk a little bit louder, especially for Jeff. He's hard of hearing. Um, so story time. Uh, in the beginning, all cattle are in line. We treat all of our databases like cattle. We don't really regard any particular database as a special host. So that is where the, the errant cattle comes in here. Uh, and so in this situation, all of our queries are running in less than 10 milliseconds, usually for like reviews, you know, the typical use case of people going to Yelp. Everything is very quick. Uh, I'm not going to discuss a specific query because this is really about all queries. This is, this is kind of how your query plan will drift when you've fully optimized it. Um, and for this particular um, talk, it's the, the world that we live in is Percona 5.5. Uh, this is a particular version of MySQL that will give us the InnoDB uh, stats auto update feature, uh, which is not available in vanilla Oracle. 
Um, I'll talk about it a bit later. NNB stats on metadata is disabled, which is by and large the recommendation for everyone that runs MySQL and is the default in MySQL 5.6. Uh, and NNB stats sample pages, which I'll talk about later, is uh, set to 256. So, in this story, uh, we had one cow leave the herd. It just kind of wandered off, started to run away, but really slowly. Um, one query pattern went from executing in milliseconds to executing in many minutes. Uh, and in our environment, that can mean the difference between a host with all of the cores idle and everything responding really quickly and the website being degraded, ops, DBAs being paged for everything going, going to heck. Um, and so the symptoms of this are like PT kill started to be triggered by pretty much everything. Um, we re noticed a very high volume of queries being killed on a single generic read replica, not on all of them, so which was important for our investigation here. And uh, this only occurs when queries are executing over 30 seconds, which is very rare in our environment. And then we did the next obvious thing, which is we went and investigated table schemas. Table schemas were not different. No errant alter had run on only one host, didn't fail on only one host. They're identical. So this is definitely something else. And the query pl plans between the good hosts and the bad hosts have diverged. They're no longer the same. So now we're curious. What, what's, what's going on? How do, we, how do we identify what is actually occurring here? Uh, and we've never had this issue before. Uh, query statistics have never drifted enough to be an actual problem for us in years. So, like, we originally raised in uh, stats sample pages to get better statistics to actually avoid the problem entirely, and then it, it came back and it bit us. So, what do you do when your query plan is different on one host? You run analyze table. And so we ran analyze table. Query plan is still bad. So we did the next obvious thing. We ran it again. <laughs> and then didn't work again. So we kind of went for third time is the charm. No, still, still bad. But then me being me, I, I ran it a fourth time just, just cause and query plan was good. So one out of five times basically we, we got a good plan. Everything is now back to normal, so we have time to reflect on, on what actually occurred here. And that's what we did. What actually happened? That is now the question. And in this situation, it be stats on metadata is disabled. So we know we're not regenerating statistics constantly, like that would cause. But clearly, this one host had regenerated and reanalyzed some statistics for tables and come up with a bad plan. Uh, and in very large tables, this in particular it gets important because if your NNB stats sample pages is set very small, you're actually not going to get a good representative estimate of like the selectivity of an index. You could find out that all of the names in the index are John and be like this is a bad index and not, not go for it. Um, so we've set this very high and the solution for this particular problem was actually setting it even higher. Um, but this has other drawbacks. There's, it's not only going to affect this one table. It's going to affect every analyze you run. And so sometimes you think you can just run it. Like, you know, I want to I wanna see if I've made the plan better by improving these statistics. And you can't just do that because when you run analyze table, you're actually going to be causing very large tables with the very high NNB stats sample pages to um, like close and reopen the table and it's going to block anything trying to get access to that table as you, as you are running this. So you can actually cause stalls on your busy tables and you'll see something that looks like waiting for table flush on a number of queries. Um, so you're waiting, yeah, just waiting for your, your, your queries to run. Um, now I'll I'm going to talk a little bit about NNB stats on metadata and why it is set to off and why everyone recommends that you send it to off. Um, it, well, one, if you look at 5.6, it's the default to be off on 5.6, which is usually kind of an indicator that on 5.5, if it's not the default to be off, you should think about why. Um, and what are the metadata commands? And this kind of lends itself to why you should think about turning this off. If you run a show index, a show table status, a show tables, or you query against those tables in the information schema, you're actually going to wind up seeing a lot of waiting for table flushes because 
uh, those are metadata queries and it's going to be closing and reopening every table um, internally and blocking all of your queries. Um, so if you have any automated monitoring, this is actually going to cause you a serious problem because these queries, there's, there's things that you do, normal investigation, normal monitoring, and it's going to cause you a, a real problem. Um, now, in it stats auto update, I've, I've kind of shown it up there a few times but not really talked about it. It is the Procona 5.5 solution to this in an automated way. Uh, basically, if 1 16th of the rows in a table or 2 billion rows have changed, it will run an analyze table for you. And if you aren't running Procona 5.5 and you're running vanilla 5.5 from Oracle, you actually, if you turn off in it stats on metadata, you have no automated way to gather statistics unless you write it. So that is a, another thing that's pretty Im important to remember here. If you actually want statistics to be updated on your tables and you have in enemy stats on metadata off and aren't running Percona 5.5, you definitely need to automate this or you're going to have never updating plans. Um, and you have a sad dog. Um, so in 5.6, um, because they, they don't ever do anything the right way, um, they've added a new feature that, that is side by side with the old feature of the ephemeral table statistics. So persistent table statistics is a very good idea and it's very nice to have it written to a table and stored and kept for you so when your machine goes down comes back up, you actually have your statistics available to you. Um, so this is a very good idea. However, if you've configured something for the ephemeral, and then you upgrade to 5.6 and you don't necessarily read all of the change logs, you might forget about this one. And they've actually duplicated this, like I, like I kind of alluded to. There is now an in InnoDB stats um, persistent uh, sample pages and an InnoDB stats sample pages. They're not related and they aren't, they don't share a number. So in, in my SQL 5.6, the default is now 20 for an NAB persistent sample pages and in the ephemeral one, it's only eight in 5.5. So you have a, a default that's changed and you have um, the persistent sample pages actually is now the default and takes precedence over the ephemeral one and it's enabled by default. So if you were like us and had set your NAB stats sample pages up to 256 and then you upgraded to 5.6, you're now on 20 if you didn't actually pay attention and set this variable. Um, and also now for something completely different, Oracle saw what Percona did and they went and uh, kind of adopted a similar feature as in an OB stats auto update in 5.6 which is similar in that it, it has like a threshold of how many rows update before it runs the next analyzed table and for this one it's 10%. So it's another good one to pay attention to if you upgrade to 5.6 or are using 5.6. Um, now, some things that you should know. Uh, you should definitely be monitoring for errant hosts. And the two main categories of this, because they, they kind of indicate different things that are important, uh, is the problem widespread. If it's a widespread problem, this, this will determine if you're looking for bad code deployment or a bad push plan, a bad alter statement. But if it's isolated and you just got one, one weird cow, uh, you're potentially seeing, seeing query plan drift, uh, which is all about this table statistics that I've been talking about. Um, and so if your cattle are not all in a line, uh, consider increasing the stats sample pages, persistent or otherwise, whatever you use, and considering if you're gathering your own statistics, how frequently you're gathering those statistics. Those are very important to keep your app resilient. And uh, if you'd like to know more, uh, all of this information is in somewhat digestible form in some blog posts on Percona. Um, performance blog for 5.5 and 5.6. Also the dev manual is, is very useful here. Um, and then social media links. All righty. So I won't be kicking Matt off the stage. He'll be able to take a seat now. Nope. And we'll be inviting uh, Michael, Zihan, and Richard back up to the stage. Do you, do you want the mic? Cool. Take it home with me. <laughs> oh, I'm 
sitting. I thought you said get off the stage. All right, so uh, since I said we're going to push all questions to the end, that way we can kind of do a general Q&A. Uh, I guess I'll kick it off because we sat up here and talked about all these cool things that everybody's doing. So uh, I guess raise your hand if your company is hiring. All right, so if anyone's looking, uh, feel free. Uh, looks like Square, Yelp, and Box are looking for DBAs. So uh, go for it. Uh, now we'll open up the floor if anybody else has any general questions. Uh, just start it off with who you're directing your question to, so I know if I need to ha pass the microphone. So a uh, question about the last slide that we saw. Is it possible to copy statistics from one server to another in the case of Drift? Like, can you copy the persistent statistics from one server to another to rectify Drift? Uh, I don't actually run 5.6, but I imagine it is possible if you do a, a flush of some kind. Um, it is also persisted to disk based on tables, so you're probably able to do some forensics or hack it in if you needed to. Um, and if it's going to the table, it's going to retrieve it for you. But I haven't seen the performance metrics of actually running that. Um, I would recommend actually just raising your, your sample pages and trying to get a better plan uh, and taking the hit. Because if it's causing real production like impact to you, you probably don't want to be testing, hey, I'm just going to copy this from this other server and hope. For the box guys, so for spatula, um, what kind of tooling is actually making the configuration change on your databases? Is it like Salt or Ansible? Uh, can you give a little bit more information about what's uh, ha actually doing the hard work behind the scenes in the configuration management? So the database configuration, that's actually another team, and that's actually abstracted away from us. Um, spatula is just all about what's going on. If something happens, then it just kicks off the process. So you're just calling like an API to make those changes? Yeah. Anybody else? Over here. Jeff, do you want to? This is a little awkward, but was there ever cons was there ever consideration for a no no SQL? where you could avoid the schema changes and just interface with a JSON. Uh, you, uh, it's just a general, yeah, um, especially for financial related. Uh, but, you know, just can you help me out? Uh, did you guys ever look at that or? Of using NoSQL? Yeah. Any um any type, whether it's document-based or what, what? I don't think so. I mean, since I got there, everything has been MySQL. Um, there was some Postgres, all completely deprecated at this point. Um, but no, I wasn't, <laughs> yes, we can all cheer for that. Uh, I, I wasn't too involved in that process, but. Um, it's already there. Yes, yeah, work, work with what we got. Regarding spatula. Um, you have three things, and one of the three data centers, and one of the hardest things about these kind of auto remediation systems is the possibility of like split brain and, and chaos. Are you taking advantage of Zookeeper locks to make sure that there's only one elected leader of Spatula so that there's only one thing taking action, that kind of thing? Uh, you mentioned that there's only one active at a time. You just using piggybacking on Zookeeper's capabilities? So, so uh, we use Zookeeper to make sure only one leader is running at any given time. Across the the two data centers. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks for confirming. Yeah. Actually, I have a follow up. Have you guys ever ended up with the split brain situation, maybe during <coughs> the early stages <coughs> of spatula? Have you guys ever ended up with a split brain like dual write master during the early stages of spatula? Never. Nice. Regarding the Square environment, um, you mentioned that you have fast path alters available. Have you looked, do you have support for, are you considering any support for in place table alters to use the fast path? In place table alters, so. Like a 5.6 algorithm equals in place for online alter tables? Right. Um, I don't know too much about the 5.6 alter in place. I know there's still definitely downsides. For example, when it gets to the slave, it's still, uh, it has to execute. In the single thread on the slave, so it still takes a long time. 
uh, there's no reason. I mean, I, I, I feel like the front end and the back end are kind of decoupled. So I, I think there's no reason that we couldn't have the back end run those kinds of alters. But uh, we definitely have to put some thought into that. I, I have a question for the box guys. Um, in Spatula, your, your health check, you were using it as, you know, as soon as the pager duty alert went out, um, you were then counting that time being the time you were down. Are you doing any external checking to actually verify that's the real time you were down? Or like how long do your health checks run before you consider something down? Can you talk to that? So uh, we, we check each DB instance uh, for th for three times. Uh, I mean, uh, let's say for the first time, uh, it, with, uh, the health checker thinks it goes down. Uh, and then we, we health checker will think it's still on. Uh, so only if we, we find uh, three checks failed, we count it as down. What's the interval yeah. between checks? Oh, so the, the interval is uh, t two seconds. So in total, it's uh, six seconds. So it's more like 52 seconds, not 46 seconds? Or like, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out if you're considering it, because you, your example said you sent the alert and then it was resolved by the spatula auto remediation. Is it actually six seconds longer than that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the 46 seconds includes that six seconds of confirming the DB instance. Okay. Down. Yeah. So the, the remediation itself takes uh, 40 seconds, around 40 seconds plus the six seconds, so in total it's 46 seconds. Okay. Uh, Spatula again, I, I think rule engines are cool. Um, can you tell me more about how you actually allow the rules to be written? Are they just in code, or are you doing something more fancy and allowing um, you know, to hot loading new rules and letting DBAs write rules, that kind of thing, or is it just baked in? Yeah, so the question was about the rule engine in, in Spatula. And right, right now, everything's in code, uh, just written in such a way that um, if a DBA does want a new rule, they'll just request it to us. We'll talk about it and then put a new rule down. And the nice thing about having it in code is that it could be highly unit tested. Oh. By the way, uh, Spatula is written in Scala. First of all, thank you guys for great talks. And uh, my question would be to Michael. Um, did you send pull requests to Percona for these new options uh, for PS POSC, PTOSC? Uh, personally, not directly, but at Percona Are you going Conf, to? Um, at least one of, one of the guys on my team used to work, to work at Percona, so we brought it up with him. But, um, I know they, at least some people there are aware of it. But yes, I should do that. OK, thank you. And, uh, but the, the patch is available on our GitHub if you just want to take a look. And yeah, thank you for open sourcing it. Yeah. Great. Hi, for the uh, spatula folks again, I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about your health check and what kind of metrics you're looking at, because it seems like that can be the, a hard part of the problem. You don't want false positives, but you'd like to get things early before they become catastrophic. So how, how big of a, a metric set are you looking at there? Yes, right now it's pretty simple for the health checker. And it basically just performs, it opens a connection and does a select one. And if that succeeds, then we're good. If that doesn't succeed, then we'll try again. For the for Michael, um, I was wondering you were talking about Shift being a UI, and then you also mentioned the fact that you would like it to integrate with the developer workflows. Has there been thought around also having a Shift API that allows you to uh, integrate the migrations via some sort of automated process, or is it because it's heavily approval based that you went with the UI model instead? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the full thing. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if there's going to be an accompanying API for the Shift uh, UI, uh -huh. so that integrates better with the uh, developer workflows? Yes, yeah, so 
there, there is an API mainly for moving migrations through states, um, but I would like to build an API for also creating migrations. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something we want to build. I have the mic. Uh, I also have a question for you, Michael. Um, the percentage information that you get in the shift UI, can that be queried through an API? So yes. Uh, are you saying can you um, ask? If I write code that can see, is migration done yet? Yes, no. Is your migration what? Is migration done yet? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. It literally just, um, I mean, PTOC isn't the nicest thing to work with. It's like 13,000 lines of Perl. Um, so we just watched, I think it prints the copy percent to standard error. And so we just read every line of standard error, parse out the percent, and then send that back to the UI. And when it's 100%, we send back to the UI that's completed. But at any point, you could ask the UI, what is the percent of this migration? Yeah. All right, do we have any more questions? All right, so we still have uh, 49 minutes. So if you guys want to hang out and network and chat and drink and eat and be merry, be my guest.